You know, every now and then, I think it's important to step back from the hurly-burly, argle-bargle of political jingle-jangle and take a looky-schnooky at the stinking thinking of the other sidey-whitey. After all, No one is correct all the time. Sometimes we on the political right can become so passionate about preserving our inherited liberties that we overlook the legitimate concerns of demonic hell spawn who want to slaughter babies and sexually mutilate children, while at the same time replacing the capitalist engine of free societies with a socialist system that has reduced civilizations to rubble and slavery wherever it's been tried. Surely these leftists have something to contribute to our national life. Tie-dyed t-shirts are very nice, for instance, especially if you wash your car by hand and need something to dry it with. Leftists have also liberated women from the restricted existence of homemaking and motherhood so they can explore a wider world of almost infinite regret and depression. And what about rap music and hip-hop? Without rap's monotonous rhythms, foul-mouthed lyrics, crappy values, and misogyny, we'd have no other way to degrade the lives of black people except welfare in the public school system. So that's a left-wing contribution, too. Anyway, in order to bring Americans together with leftists, I sometimes like to explore those areas where right and left can find common ground. One example, both right and left understand that free speech is one of the foundational values that uphold American liberty. Indeed, leftists are so committed to preserving their freedom of speech that if anyone else tries to speak, they immediately set out to stop them. In addressing free speech, the left has three main areas of concern. One, book banning. Let's say a few small-minded parents force an elementary school to remove a perfectly reasonable book of homosexual pornography from the library's lower shelves and put it on a higher shelf where only third graders can reach it. This is what the left calls book banning, and it must be opposed in the name of free speech and homosexual pornography. In the same way, when Ryan Anderson wrote a book in opposition to the transgender movement, left-wing activists selflessly took time out from threatening the lives of Matt Walsh and his family to ensure Amazon dropped Anderson's book from their store, which of course is not book banning, because you can still get Anderson's book in any dark alley where books are sold by people trying to avoid being assaulted by left-wing activists. Two, misinformation. Now, of course, to most of us, Misinformation is just the harmless winner of a beauty contest where bearded women with penises parade on stage in tuck-friendly bikinis. But no, misinformation is actually a serious problem, and it must be suppressed in order for free speech to thrive. During the last presidential election, for instance, when Hunter Biden's laptop revealed a network of Biden family corruption that possibly reached a candidate Joe Biden himself— Now Secretary of State Antony Blinken arranged for over 50 former CIA spies to tar the laptop as Russian misinformation. And with the help of a vigilant news media, that Russian misinformation was suppressed before anyone could find out it was true. So you can see why the left feels it's very important to suppress misinformation, if it's true. Finally, three, violence. There is some speech the left believes should not be free, and that is speech that is actually violence. Right-wing speech, for instance, is violence. You can tell right-wing speech is violence because whenever right-wingers try to speak, left-wingers physically attack them. Now, you may say, but wait, that's left-wing violence. (laughs) But you see, violence is how the left expresses itself, so their violence is actually a form of speech. Once you understand that right-wing speech is violence and left-wing violence is speech, it then becomes clear that the left supports free speech as long as it's violence and opposes violence as long as it's speech, just as they wish to suppress misinformation whenever it's information and oppose book banning only so long as it doesn't involve banning books, which they support. Because if you don't ban books, it leads to the spread of misinformation, who, let's face it, looks absolutely ridiculous in that bikini. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is the new and improved Andrew Clavin Show. Wow, that was great. I know some people, p- people hate it when we change anything. So we, we're sure we're going to get a lot of letters wanting the Hunky Dunky song back. And I kind of miss the Hunky Dunky song, but never mind. We are still here laughing our way through the fall of the Republic. This is a great time for you to subscribe to my personal Andrew Claven YouTube channel. Uh, you get exclusive content. I don't know who it's from or where it comes from, but it will come to your house and then burst into flame. Uh, and you will get three wishes 
and then go to hell. Uh, but also, if you leave a comment there and the comment is actually just as hateful and as disgusting and morally de degrading, not just degrading to you, but to the rest of us, we will read that comment on the show because that's what we do here. Today's comment is from Joshua Stanley. Uh, he says, the contrast between Clavin's appearance and his lovely daughter suggests that his wife is actually Helen of Troy. Uh, you're not the only person to say that. It's deeply hurtful. Uh, obviously, completely true, but uh, deeply hurtful. All right. Today's episode, How America Went Mad. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about bent coppers uh, and the latest Trump indictment. If at first you can't destroy the Re Republic, try, try again. We'll also talk about illegal aliens crossing the border from outer space. If Mars needs women, is it fair to give them Dylan Mulvaney? Let's get started with chapter one, the fungus among us. We're going to take start this show back in the past. 1972, Richard Nixon's president of the United States. To try to oust him from office, the Democrats nominated a senator named George McGovern. Probably most of you don't remember this. McGovern was so insanely left wing, he believed in legal abortion, legal marijuana and amnesty for people who violated the government's laws, uh, something no true American would ever condone, which just goes to show you how far we've come in 50 years. And if you despair, if you're afraid that you can't win the country back, remember, it took them 50 years to do it through the culture. And right now, uh, there's a lot of social conservatism going on. Social conservatism is at its highest, the highest it's ever been in 10 years, close to 40 percent. Social liberalism is close to 30 percent, the lowest it's been in a long time. So we have patience and play the long game just like they did. But anyway... This guy was so radical. George McGovern was so radical. They called him the amnesty abortion and uh, what was the other one? Uh, amphetamine, something like that. It was three A's that he was so radical. Nobody would run with him. So he had to find a running mate in a big hurry. And he nominated a guy. He named a guy named Senator Thomas Eagleton. And it turned out within days, Senator Thomas Eagleton was shown to be mentally ill. He had been hospitalized at least three times. He'd gone through electroshock therapy to get him out of severe depression. And he had to step down. So there was this very witty British actor named Peter Ustinoff, and he went on the Dick Cavett show, and he said, no, you shouldn't make him step down, because when you're in Britain and you're put away for being insane and you get out, you get a certificate of sanity. So this is one of the only politicians you have who can actually guarantee that he's sane. And I want to say I want to address the country as it is right now, because I feel exactly the same way. When I was in my 20s, I wrote about this in my memoir, The Great Good Thing. I went completely nuts. I went totally insane. I could not tell the difference between the delusions in my head and the reality of the outer world. And by truly a miracle of God and a brilliant work of a psychiatrist, I, I was utter, I went sane. I was utterly cured. I don't know anybody else this has ever happened to. I went from being suicidal and delusional to being a joyful, fulfilled, sound, spiritually sound person. I've never seen that happen to anybody else. So unlike most people, I feel that I'm qualified to judge when people are crazy and when they're sane, because I've been both. And I'm looking at the country today, and I see a country that has gone nuts. It has gone morally nuts. Our lawmen no longer believe in enforcing the law. Our newsmen no longer believe in reporting the news. And judging by the fact that they shut down our churches because they were so afraid of death, our priests no longer believe in God and the resurrection. And this isn't because they've come up with something new. It's not because they're doing something so brilliant that we've never seen it before. They call it progressivism. But no, they've just gone back to a very old delusion. And because of that delusion, they cannot tell the difference between the delusions in their heads and the reality of the outer world. That's the definition of madness. The lie that they believe, the delusion that has tripped them up, is one of the oldest in the world. It's the delusion that some men are righteous enough to rule over others. This is the lie that democracy is made because every man deserves to be free right? That's the lie they tell us. And so therefore, there are some people who deserve to rule over others because they are the ones that everybody elects. That's not true. Democracy is there because no man deserves to rule another. No man is righteous. That's the idea, the Christian idea that caused them to create a democracy in which a power was limited. And power, the government was not constructed to make all men free. It was constructed to make no man 
more powerful than another, so much more powerful than another than he couldn't be held to account. The idea that people are righteous and can rule over others is like that fungus. I'm sure you've heard of this fungus, the cordyceps fungus. It implants itself. It's really disgusting. It implants itself in ants. It floods the ant's brains with chemicals, takes the ant's mind over, and then forces the ant to implant itself in a place where the fungus can grow, and then the fungus grows out of the ant. It's absolutely disgusting. You will have heard of it if you ever saw the first episode of the HBO uh, adaptation of the game, The Last of Us. Remember John Hanna played this doctor who talked about how the zombies were going to come as a fungus. This is cut three. Viruses can make us ill, but fungi can alter our very minds. There's a fungus that infects insects, gets inside an ant, for example, travels through its circulatory system to the ant's brain and then floods it with hallucinogens, thus bending the ant's mind to its will. This idea that people can be righteous and therefore have the right to rule over others, authoritarianism, turns everything into itself. You frequently hear me say that I oppose feminism, but that's not true. I don't oppose the rights of women. I oppose the leftist authoritarianism that has taken over feminism like one of these ants, right? It basically is now there to destroy the family that Marx understood was the basis of all freedom. So rather than fighting for women's rights, what feminists really fight for are male values that take women out of the home, out of the role of motherhood and nurturing and homemaking, which are all essential to a well-run uh, country, a free country. Karl Marx and Frederick en Engels wanted the basic unit of society to be the herd. They wanted people to be herd animals. Uh, so they wanted to get women, they said this, they wrote this, we want to get women out of the home, back into the herd, back into business. I'm against critical race theory and affirmative action and reparations and all that racism that they call anti-racism, not because I want to hurt black people, obviously, my fellow citizens who are black, I don't want to do that at all, but it's because leftist authoritarianism, like this fungus, has gotten into uh, race racial equality uh, efforts and turned it into itself, right? And I have actually fought with members of my own audience, whom I love, to support laws that let gay people live in the open and be happy and free with one another. But I am against gay activism because it's there to destroy the male-female family, which is the center of every sane, free society. I oppose this fungus, this authoritarianism that is based on the idea it's based on the idea that someone is righteous enough to rule over others. And if you are one of that cohort of righteous people, then you have the right to break every rule, change every law, go around every system to do the right thing. It's infected every movement that once was a civil rights movement. It has taken over them all like a fungus that has seeped into their brains and turned people who are supposed to enforce the law, report the news, help us worship God, it has turned them all into zombie ants. Did you know our friends at Genucel have upgraded their most popular package to feature their top-selling deep-firming vitamin C serum plus ultra retinal moisturizer with natural retinal alternative. Right now, you can take advantage of this limited-time package upgrade for 70% off. Why waste time and money to go get work done to your face when you can get Genucel skincare shipped right to your door? Genucel Secret is a family recipe for over 20 years that makes it safe for all skin types and perfect for both men and women. Made by a compounding pharmacist in small batches, always safe, always cruelty-free and natural. My marketing manager, Dana, loves Genucel's under-eye bag cream. She said she cannot go a day without it. Go to Genucel.com slash Clavin and try Genucel's most popular package for 70% off, featuring both Genucel's Ultra Retinol and Genucel's Firming Serum. Get a complimentary spa essentials box with every package order, plus free upgrade to priority shipping. That's Genucel.com slash Clavin. Genucel.com slash Clavin. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, ooh, ooh, ooh. I want that. How do you spell Clavin? It's K-L-A-V-A-N. Which brings me to chapter two, Bent Coppers. Bent Coppers. I've seen enough bent coppers. You know, if I see a bent copper, I'll go after him. Bent coppers. He's your bent copper for the 21st century. Bent coppers. And I'm doing mine. And it's called Nick and Bent Copper. Bent coppers, that's a different story. I'm interested in one thing and one thing only. And that's bent coppers. You know me. If I see a bent copper, I only know one way, and that's full throttle. <laughs> All right. 
our, because of our, this fungus of authoritarianism, this fungus of self-righteousness, our lawmen no longer believe in enforcing the law fairly. Donald Trump, your former president, has been indicted again. This is an historic federal indictment by, of the former president by the Department of Justice. Not only a former president, but the leading candidate in the next election against the sitting president, who, of course, runs the executive division, which includes the Department of Justice. So it's suspicious from the get-go. It's not the kind of thing you should do light, uh, lightly. According to sources talking to ABC News, the charges against Trump include willfully retaining the national defense documents. Remember, he had it in Mar-a-Lago, obviously, conspiring to obstruct justice, withholding the documents, corruptly concealing the records, concealing a document in a federal investigation, scheming to conceal and making false statements who could carry a maximum of 75 years in prison. Here's Trump's response, cut 18. Very sadly, we're a nation in decline, and yet they go after a popular president, a president that got more votes than any sitting president in the history of our country, by far, and did much better the second time in the election than the first. And they go after him on a boxer's hoax, just like the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax, and all of the others, this has been going on for seven years, that they can't stop because it's election interference at the highest level. There's never been anything like what's happened. I'm an innocent man, I'm an innocent person. Uh, they had the Mueller hoax, the Mueller report, and that came out, no collusion after two and a half years. That was set up by Hillary Clinton and Democrats, but this is what they do, this is what they do so well. You know, even if you hate Trump, even if you think Trump is the worst thing ever, even if you'd like to see him pull out of the upcoming election, it's hard to argue with him about this. It is hard to say because it's it's not, let's say he broke the law. It's not that they're prosecuting him for apparently breaking the law. It's the people they're not prosecuting, including Joe Biden, who also had classified documents and mishandled classified documents. But more importantly, Hillary Clinton, who not only had thousands of classified documents going through her phone illegally, but bleached her phone, electronically bleached her phone so that they couldn't trace them. And you remember what then FBI head James Comey said about that. Here's cut 17. When I look at the facts we gathered here, as I said, I see evidence of great carelessness, but I do not see evidence that is sufficient to establish that Secretary Clinton or those with whom she was corresponding both talked about classified information on email and knew when they did it, they were doing something that was against the law. Right? So given that assessment of the facts, my understanding of the law, my conclusion was and remains, no reasonable prosecutor would bring this case. No reasonable prosecutor would bring the second case in a hundred years focused on gross negligence. Bent coppers. I've seen enough bent coppers. You know, if I see a bent copper, I'll go after him. That montage was from a terrific British show called Line of Duty. And the guy speaking is a character called Ted Hastings, played by a wonderful character actor named Adrian Dunbar. And Hastings is an honest man who leads a division trying to ferret out bent coppers like James Comey. And he's the reason he's so, he's so honest, he won't even cheat on his wife after his wife has left him. And the reason it is always implied throughout the show is because he's a Catholic, because he has faith, which tells them, the Christian faith, that no man is righteous, therefore nobody can be trusted with power. And therefore the police have to oversee, be overseen, and, and hunted down. Of course, the other cops hate him because they think he's a rat. But no, he just understands that people are corrupt. Anybody with power is going to be corrupt, corrupted by that power, and they have to be watched. That has totally gone by the board because the left believes it's so righteous that the law no longer matters. That is what they believe. They believe that they themselves are righteous and their philosophy is righteous. And they know in their hearts that's not true. But because they, they have to maintain that facade, that delusion, they have to silence everybody else and attack everybody else. If the Supreme Court overturns their whims, then it's illegitimate. The fact that Hillary Clinton was not indicted for crimes far worse than anything Trump could have done reveals who they are. I'm not speculating that the DOJ uh, is dirty. I can prove that the DOJ was dirty. Before the indictment came out, the New York Times was running an article saying, oh, we have sources telling us that Trump's about to be indicted. And Trump was saying, I'm not hearing that. I'm not hearing it. So the sources weren't in the Trump uh, clan. They weren't in the Trump 
area they were coming from the federal government. They were coming from the Department of Justice. So the Department of Justice is talking to the New York Times, is telling the New York Times that Trump is going to be indicted. But, but when the House Oversight Committee asks the FBI to turn over a document, an unclassified document that includes an accusation that Joe Biden, when he was vice president, was bribed with $5 million, the FBI says no. Christopher Wray actually said, oh, this document doesn't exist. The first thing they said was, no, this document doesn't exist. The document accuses Joe Biden of taking a bribe of $5 million while he is vice president, but the document just doesn't exist. So Comer, the head of the, James Comer, the head of the House Oversight Committee, subpoenas the document. Christopher Wray says, I'm not going to turn it over. Comer then says, well, we're going to hold you in contempt. And finally, finally, he breaks down, the FBI breaks down, and they allow the House to go in and take a look at this document, which, of course, does exist. Now, think about that for a minute. Somebody in the DOJ is calling the New York Times and telling him Trump is going to be indicted, but nobody will go to the House Oversight Committee and show them a document in, in response to a legal subpoena. They won't show. So we know these guys are dirty. It's not like they might be dirty. We know they're dirty. We don't know what Trump did. We don't know whether he violated the law or what he did, if it really falls under the law. I know if a, just an ordinary soldier did what he did, he'd be arrested. But when Clinton wasn't arrested and when he, he is indicted— we know they're dirty because of the way they're dealing with information. So now the House goes in and it looks at this document. And Jamie Raskin, the ranking member of the House Oversight Committee, the Democrat, the key de Democrat, comes out and he says, well, you know, the former Attorney General William Barr investigated these accusations and he dismissed the charge. And Barr says, no, that's not what happened. It was the exact opposite. The document was sent on for further investigation. So now Com Comer comes on and he goes on Just the News, and this is what he says about the document he saw. Yes, it is Ukraine. This uh, uh, Form 1023 uh, involves uh, a business person uh, from Ukraine uh, who allegedly sent a bribe, a uh, substantial bribe, to then Vice President Joe Biden. Sources at, I believe this is the New York Post has the sources, saying that a Burisma executive, you all remember Burisma, the oil company, the energy company, that Hunter Biden had this massively well-paying sinecure, I think it was $50,000 a month, for sitting on their board when he had no expertise in this field whatsoever. So a Burisma executive wanted to get involved in the American oil business, but he needed help because, this is what the document says, apparently, he needed help because Burisma corruption was under investigation by a prosecutor named Victor Shokin. And what he wanted to do was pay Joe Biden $5 million and possibly Hunter Biden another $5 million to get rid of this guy, Victor Shokin, right? So that he, they wouldn't expose the corruption in Burisma and Burisma could then go on and make more money in the American oil industry. Now, not saying Joe Biden is guilty because who would ever suspect Joe Biden of being part of a family of influence peddlers illegally using their offices for gain? That would be a shocking thing to just come out and say right here where everyone knows it's true. Vice President Biden bragged that he went to Ukraine, talked to the president of then president of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko, Poroshenko. There was a billion dollars he was supposed to offer of U.S. aid, and he told Poroshenko that he was not going to give him that $1 billion in U.S. aid. This is, according to Joe Biden, what happened. Cut 19. They were walking out to the press conference and said, no, nah, I said, I'm not going to, or, or, we're not going to give you the billion dollars. They said, you have no authority. You're not the president. The president said, I said, call him. <laughs> I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars. I said, you're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Well, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. So the story then would be that he took a $5 million bribe to stop an investigation into Burisma, where his son was getting 50, I believe it was $50,000 a month to do nothing except get him obviously make contact to Joe Biden. He then used U.S. aid, our foreign aid, which is supposed to be there for the benefit of our country and those countries we choose to help, to blackmail 
the president of Ukraine into getting rid of this DA. Now, no prosecutor, no reasonable prosecutor working for this DOJ would ever prosecute that. But that's a pretty interesting story that holds together pretty well. And this is just a DOJ of bent goppers. James Comey, I believe, by the way, I believe these guys think they're patriots because they think that they're the righteous people and, and Trump represents an existential threat to our democracy. They, it doesn't occur to them that the only way they can do right is by following the law, enforcing the law equally to all people. No, they're bent. Their sense of righteousness has bent them. This is because they're in the grip of this fungus, this fungus that is eating away at their brains, telling them they're the righteous ones. They're the ones, not all the 70 million people who voted for Donald Trump. They're not the righteous ones. The people at the FBI, the DOJ are the righteous ones, and they have, for have the right to supersede the system that's in place, the laws that are in place to falsely and unfairly prosecute them. And again, this has nothing to do with Donald Trump. It has nothing to do with how you or I feel about Donald Trump or how the left feels about Donald Trump. But this is something that everybody should see is just unfair. In the grip of this fungus, they cannot tell the difference between the delusion of righteousness in their head and the reality of the world. And that is the definition of madness. Getting a good night's sleep is essential for your physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Uh-oh. That's why you need to check out Helix Mattress. I have a Helix Mattress, and it's so comfortable. I love to stay awake on it because I never sleep. Helix has harnessed years of extensive mattress expertise to bring their customers a truly elevated sleep experience. They just launched their new Helix Elite. The Helix Elite collection includes six different mattress models, each tailored for specific sleep positions and firmness preferences. Helix provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences, such as if you're a hot sleeper, a side sleeper, or a non-sleeper like me. I've had my Helix for years. I love it. They even have a sleep quiz that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress, because why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? Go to helixsleep.com slash Clavin. Take their two-minute sleep quiz to find the perfect mattress for your body and sleep type. Their flexible payment plans make it so that a great night's sleep is never far away. For a limited time, Helix is offering up to 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for my listeners. This is their best offer yet. Hurry over to helixsleep.com slash Clavin. With Helix, better sleep starts now, but not for me because I don't know how to spell Clavin. Oh, yes, I do. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. All right, that brings me to chapter three, Mars Needs Women. These were the words that startled the world. This was the reason for an invasion that shocked the Earth. Martians, beings from outer space, with one prime objective, women, Earth women, to help repopulate their dying planet, to bring new blood to an ancient civilization. Beauty and the beasts. Only the beasts were men. Martian men. Every woman checked and double checked. Only the most perfect. The most beautiful. Is Earth to be ravished because Mars needs women? <laughs> Remember that? I can't believe there's a real trailer. Remember that, ladies, only the most beautiful deserve to be ravished. The rest will be left behind. All right. Our newsmen no longer believe in reporting the news. They believe they're righteous. So why would they report the news? They can't imagine the simple fact that very good people disagree very strongly about very important things. If you're righteous, anyone who disagrees with you must be bad. So you don't need to report the facts exactly. You want to make sure to report the facts that will guide the lowly into your righteousness. And the problem with that is not only is it madness in itself, it creates madness in the rest of us, too, because we don't know if you can't believe the people assigned to report the facts, if you can't even believe they are reporting the facts, you begin to think that the opposite of what they're saying must be true. And that is a kind of madness in itself. And this is so frustrating. And I know it, it annoys people, makes people annoyed with me because just because we're lied to about things doesn't mean that we know the truth, right? Uh, we were lied to about the last election. The elections were rigged in terms of information, Hunter Biden's laptop being suppressed, the Russian collusion story, which was a total nonsense, basically just dirty politics by the opposition, Hillary. There was tons of fraud. We know there was tons of election fraud. And we were told it was the most honest election ever. 
But not only that, not only that, if we said, gee, there's some, a lot of fraud here, we were banned from the internet. The president of the United States was knocked off social media for saying that he thought the election was stolen, which was a per perfectly reasonable thing to say. That doesn't mean we've proved it was stolen. I don't believe we have. I'm not saying it wasn't. I'm just saying we haven't proved it. But it's easy to believe when you're being silenced and lied to that the opposite must be true. It's the same with the Chinese virus. We were lied to about the Chinese virus. Listen to this. This is a conspiracy theory montage put together by the people at Grabian. These are top newsmen and entertainers telling us about conspiracy theories during the Chinese virus. Cut five. President retweeting a conspiracy video alleging that masks do not work. The video was then removed by Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube because it violated rules against spreading misinformation. The second most powerful man in the world revealing himself in this video as a mask truther. All around the country, over the weekend, protests popped up. These morons and internet conspiracy theories demanding an immediate end to lockdowns. And let's be honest, people, this is both insane and counterproductive. Even the wackos, Trump wackos, are, are, are doing conspiracy theories saying those numbers are padded. What should we say to people who conspiracy theorize about an overcount of the deaths? Now, part of the conspiracy theory is that the disease started in a laboratory in Wuhan. Just weeks ago, Dr. Anthony Fauci rejected the conspiracy that coronavirus was man-made in a lab in Wuhan, China. And yet this week, Donald Trump is still pushing the debunked bunkum. <laughs> Every single one of those conspiracy theories turned out to be true. Every single one of them. And I know that Brian Stelter and Stephen Colbert and Anthony Fauci are going house to house, apologizing to each and every one of you uh, for being such jackasses about it. But they were convinced that they were righteous. They were convinced that centralized power was a good thing because it was being run by people like themselves who are the righteous ones. Listen to this. This is the new CDC director, right? Mandy Cohen, her name is. She's describing how she, when she was, I think it was in North Carolina, Carolina, she was the health director. She would call her fellow health directors, and this is how they would come up with the rules for the freedom-destroying, children-destroying, economy-destroying lockdown rules. Cut six. I would call, probably the person I called most was the Secretary of Health and Human Services in Massachusetts. She worked for a Republican governor just to, um, but you know, when she was like, are you, are you gonna let them have professional um, uh, football? And I was really like, nope. And she's like, okay, neither are we, neither are we. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so uh, you know, it was like conversations like that. So, or, or I'd be like, so when are you gonna think about lightening up a mess? They were like, so you're like next Monday. I'm like, okay, next Monday. So they were all laughing at these random rules and how randomly they were making these rules without, you know, what they should be doing. They should be in sackcloth and ashes. These rules destroyed the lives of children. They destroyed businesses. They were oppressive, an oppressive violation of constitutional norms. What the hell is she laughing about? She's laughing because she knows that she is the righteous. She was the expert. She was the person who was in charge of doing this to the poor people who didn't know any better, who shouldn't be governing themselves. They lied about the vaccines saying that they didn't tell us as that they were more risky than they told us they were. Uh, they didn't tell us that they wouldn't stop transmission. And now people believe that these things are just poison, that no one should take them. It's probably still true. I think it's still true that old people and people who have comorbidities should take them. Young people shouldn't take them because they're dangerous. I don't, I don't believe. But when people in power lie, it becomes almost in, irresistible to believe, not to believe the people who oppose them. The people who oppose them seem to be telling the truth, which can drive us mad too, the people who are not doing the original line. Listen, I was happy to see Tucker Carlson come back to Twitter. I think it will change the media. I think it's a dynamic, important thing. I didn't like his show, his first show very much at all because it kind of partook of this, that whatever the other guys were saying must be true, and he would just assert those things without actually any proof. And the one that kind of made me laugh was the one about aliens from outer space. This is what Tucker said. Yesterday, for example, a former Air Force officer who worked for years in military intelligence came forward as a whistleblower to reveal that the U.S. government has physical evidence of crashed non-human made aircraft, as well as the bodies of the pilots who flew those aircraft. The Pentagon has spent decades studying these otherworldly remains in order to build more technologically advanced weapon systems. Okay, that's what the former intel officer revealed, and it was clear he was telling the truth. In other words, UFOs are actually real, and apparently so is extraterrestrial life. 
Now we know. In a normal country, this news would qualify as a bombshell, the story of the millennium. <laughs> now, listen, I love Tucker and I don't want to, I'm not attacking him. I'm sure he's going to get his game back and all this stuff. And I think what he's doing is really, really important. But no, now we don't know. <laughs> Just because people lie to us and they do and they lie and lie and lie. It's nuts to just think that everything else is true. Here's the story he's talking about. He's a former Air Force officer, an intelligence guy named David Grush. He's talking to News Nation reporter Ross Colthwart. This is cut eight. There's a sophisticated uh, disinformation campaign targeting the U.S. populace, which is extremely unethical and immoral. You are saying to the human race, for the first time, an official intelligence representative at a high level from the US government is saying publicly, we are not alone. We're definitely not alone. Absolutely, the data points empirically that we're not alone, yeah. Do we have bodies? Do we have species of well, non Well, naturally, um, when you recover something that's either landed or crashed, um, sometimes you encounter um, dead pilots. And uh, believe it or not, as, fan as fantastical as that sounds, it's true. Now, he hasn't seen any of these bodies or spacecrafts. He has heard about them. Are they, is any of this true? I, almost surely not. I mean, scientifically, it's almost impossible for it to be true. But how can you know when everybody's lying to you? Uh, Glenn Reynolds wrote a wonderful substack about this where he pointed out that there used to be stories that rocks were falling from the sky and no one believed them. Thomas Jefferson uh, heard the two professors in Western Connecticut had said they had fought, seen rocks fall from the sky. And Jefferson said it's easier to believe the two Yankee professors could lie than to admit that stones could fall from heaven. But in fact, it was a meteorite. Stones had fallen out of heaven into Western Connecticut, which makes this story much more interesting. The one from Las Vegas uh, last month, I think it was, I think it was in, in May. Here's CBS Channel 8 in Vegas reporting on this story. Cut 16. It's almost midnight on May 1st when a Las Vegas Metro police officer's body cam catches this. Something flashing low in the sky. 911 emergency. Minutes later. There's, a, there's like an eight-foot person beside it. And another one's inside, and it has big eyes and looking at us, and it's still there. Someone calls 911, reporting two large figures in their backyard. Uh, no, I'm so nervous right now. The 8 News Now investigators obtaining another officer's video as he sent to the Northwest Valley home. I have butterflies, bro. Uh, Everyone saw a shooting star, then these people say there's aliens in their backyard. By now, mm -hmm. it's more than an hour yeah, after that bright it? light. Officers meeting it? up with the caller yeah, and his family. What'd you see? It was like a... It was like a big creature. A big creature? Yeah, like a long testing top. I'm not going to BS you guys. One of my partners said they saw something fall out of the sky, too, so that's yes. why I'm kind of curious. <laughs> now, now, listen, there's, there's a lot of questions about this. So you, should, you, you cannot jump to believing this. To travel these kinds of distances, they'd have to be coming from another star. We know that our local planets are not populated. We're pretty sure that our local planets are not populated. So if they're coming from another star, they'd have to be able to bend space-time. They'd have to find wormholes. They'd have to be able to, you know, have time folds and things like this. And that raises the question is, if they have technology that good, why do, why do their spaceships crash all the time? Well, you know, it's kind of like they bend time and they reach Earth and it's like, put, 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 put. oh no, oh no, my spark plugs just blew out. You know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. On the other hand, I mean, a journey like that, because of the time, all this would Right now, we would think it would be almost impossible, but that doesn't mean anything. There was just a discovery, kind of cool, of a dis uh, subterranean cave system in South Africa that was populated by these things called Homo Nalidi. We have a picture of them. It looks kind of like Michael Knowles. Uh, Homo Nalidi, which had a brain the, a third the size of ours, but it did things that only humans do, like it carved symbols on walls inside the system. So they're kind of like in that movie where they go into the caves and there are these people living there. That raises huge, huge questions about what a human being is, what makes a human being, what makes a human being different than a dog or other animals. So there are all these things. I mean, doctors used to come to people's house and kill them because they didn't know about germs. They didn't know about anything. And yet people wanted to believe. So we believe in scientists. But scientists, if you get them alone and give them a couple of drinks, will tell you there is a lot of stuff they don't know. So it's possible. It is possible. But then there's the last question. And this is the question that always bothers me. If they're here and they're crashing and it's secret and why, you know, why aren't they talking to us? If they're here, 
What are they here for? We seek female volunteers, unmarried, of good health, and possessing the common indicators of fertility and reproduction. Why, your suggestion is insane. We are in earnest. <laughs> That's a Don, Donnie Kirk, I think, was in this film. God, how the mighty had fallen. All right, remember, girls, only the most beautiful deserve to be ravished. I have one more theory, though, about why the Martians may be here. I've often thought this because the question is not why are they, just why are they here? Because they might be here to devour us or to steal our resources or something. But why are they here in secret? Why not just announce themselves and say, hello, we'd like to watch your, study your society. The only logical explanation I can come up with is they're here because we're like television to them. We're like entertainment. Maybe it's entertaining to see a race of creatures so stupid they believe they can change their genders uh, and run their economies from the top down and ignore the law to find justice and ignore the facts to find the truth. I mean, look, we may have all gone insane, but at least we're entertaining. And maybe that's why the Martians are here. Father's Day is just around the corner. If you're looking for the perfect gift to show your dad you love him, look no further than Moink. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. I'm eating my way through my Moink box now. It's difficult to watch because I'm just ravenous for this stuff. Moink even lets you choose the meat delivered in every box. Select an existing box. Or create your own. Set your delivery cadence and enjoy delicious meat. You can cancel any time. You won't want to. I just received my own Moink box. Mine was the standard one. It comes with a little bit of everything. Chicken, ribeye, burgers, and steak. When I tell you you need to try Moink, you need to try it. Their bacon is some of the best I have ever had, and it's bacon. Moink is all about supporting the family farm. Think about this. 2% of Americans are farmers, but all of us eat. So what are you waiting for? Give the gift of meat this Father's Day. Go to moinkbox.com slash Clavin. Get a free package of that delicious bacon in your first box. That's moinkbox.com slash Clavin, spelled M O I N K box.com slash Clavin, moinkbox.com slash Clavin. I know what you're saying. How do you spell free bacon? It's K L A V A N. There are All right, the final chapter, deleting Jesus. Now, obviously, the idea that people are righteous is a pre-Christian idea. The idea that people, that some people deserve to have power over others are born. What did uh, Jefferson and others used to say? They were born with spurs while others were born with a saddle to be ridden. That idea is obviously a pre-Christian and a post-Christian notion. I once said a long time ago when Trump first started running for president that he was our first post-Christian candidate. And what I meant by that was that he honored money. He was disrespectful to failure. He would call people losers if they didn't have money. When he was asked about Christianity and forgiveness of sins, he said, I just try not to sin and then I don't need forgiveness. That's not because, that's because he was a left winger. He would, the culture that created him was a left wing culture. He was a Hollywood guy. He was a New York guy. He was created by left wing culture. And the thing about the absence of Jesus is it's not there because of logic, because there's some new discovery or new logic that has told us the Christian religion is not to be believed. It's because of the culture, the way the culture has been manipulated. I don't know if you saw this amazing scene from Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was a pride parade. You can just play this MOS so people can see it in the background. A pride parade was on, and there was a street preacher uh, talking about God and condemning homosexuality. And a cop went over to him, and he said, let them have their day, which interestingly— it, is not in the Constitution. It's not in the Constitution that gay people get their day when they can talk without people disagreeing with them. And this guy said, I'm on public property. I'm preaching God. God cares about this. And the cop arrested him. And his chief actually bought, backed him up. Now, that is that is a bent copper. That is a guy who thinks that the gays having their day, having their pride, is more important than this guy's freedom to preach the gospel. And the way, the reason he thinks that, the reason he feels he has the right to put this man in cuffs for preaching the gospel is because the culture has been manipulated. When I was a kid, when I didn't believe in God at all, it was my, my people wouldn't believe in God. And by that, I mean coastal, intellectual, sophisticated people who wanted to be in the arts. You just didn't believe in God. And all around me, college prof- I was in college, and college professors were telling me that, therefore, because there was no God, 
there was no morality. There was no objective morality. Morality was relative, and one culture was just as good as another, and you know this whole routine. And then I read this book, and I've talked about this before, Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, which is about a man who, in the, be- the belief that a great man can make his own morality, kills two women with an ax. And when I read that scene in which he murders these two women, I suddenly thought, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's evil. You, you can't write a world. You can't create a world. One of the girls, the women, is retarded. I know we're not supposed to use that, but that's what she is. She's mentally, uh, has mental defect. And he hits her with an axe. And you think, no, hitting an innocent, afflicted woman with an axe is evil. There's no relativity there at all. And that really disturbed me because it meant there must be a God, but I was not allowed to believe in God. Now, in Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky strongly suggests that the only redemption this murderer is going to get is from Jesus Christ, that he's going to have to find Jesus Christ to be redeemed. And so what I did was I edited out Jesus because I didn't want to believe that. And what I said to myself was something on the order of, well, when he says Christ, he's really it's really symbolic of blank, blankety, blank, blank. I can't remember what I thought it was symbolic of, but it was anything to delete Jesus from that scene. The other day, hilariously, I was reading a book about crime and punishment. It's called the good book. It's called The Sinner and the Saint, Dostoevsky and the Gentleman Murderer Who Inspired a Masterpiece. And I laughed out loud because the author, a guy named Kevin Birmingham, did the same thing. He tried to edit Jesus out of crime and punishment because he didn't want to see them there. He said at the end, Raskolnikov is the murderer's name, and at the end, Dostoevsky strongly suggests that Raskolnikov to be redeemed is going to have to find Jesus. But but Birmingham says, Raskolnikov is guided by life alone, not by ideology or even by faith. Raskolnikov does not find God at the end of crime and punishment. Now, technically, that's true. He doesn't find God at the end of crime and punishment. But this is what Dostoevsky says. Under his pillow lay the New Testament. He took it up mechanically. The book belonged to Sonia, the faithful prostitute. She believes in God, and she's trying to convert him. It was one from which she had read the raising of Lazarus to him. Uh, he says, to his great surprise, she had, he was always worried that she was going to worry him about religion. He, she would talk about the gospel and pester him with books, but she didn't. But he had, he had not opened the book, and he did not open it now. But one thought passed through his mind. Can her convictions, Sonia's convictions, can her convictions not be mine now? He did not know that the new life would not be given him for nothing, that he would have to pay dearly for it, that it would cost him great striving, great suffering. But this is the beginning of a new story, the story of the gradual renewal of a man, the story of his gradual regeneration, of his passing from one world into another, of his initiation into a new unknown life. That might be the subject of a new story, but our present story has ended. So so Raskolnikov doesn't find Jesus at the end of the book. He finds Jesus after the book, and it's very, very clear what Dostoevsky, who was an Orthodox Christian, it is very clear what he's saying. This editing God, and specifically Christ, out of stories where he belongs, is so endemic to our intellectual and elite class, there ought to be a delete Jesus key on their computers. They do. One of the reasons I canceled my subscription to Sports Illustrated is because they named Christian quarterback Drew Brees Sportsman of the Year in 2010. And it started out with Drew Brees saying, the thing that makes me, that uplifts me is my faith. The next two paragraphs, you can go and look it up. I don't have time to read it now, but go look it up. Is explaining, well, what he meant by faith. You might say he meant faith and excellence faith. He meant faith in Jesus Christ, but they edited him out. You know, my favorite book reviewer at the Wall Street Journal, a guy named Barton Swaim, writes a lot of reviews of biographies. And he says, this is what he said just about, I don't know, three or four weeks ago. He said, I don't know how many lives, biographies I've read, in which otherwise fair and capable biographers dismiss or minimize their subjects' expressions of faith for no obvious reason. The great statesman or philosopher or composer may have said that he trusted in God or that he found solace in a scriptural text. So goes this interpretive habit, but we know He didn't mean it. They edit Jesus out. Has anybody seen the movie Greyhound? I talked about it on the show once. I do not understand why conservatives have not elevated this movie and made a big fuss about it. Some of them haven't seen it because it's been limited to Apple TV. Not everybody has Apple TV. This is with Tom Hanks, written by Tom Hanks. I, I tweeted that they should elevate this, and I got the usual thing from conservatives. 
it bugs me. Conservatives saying, oh, I don't watch Hollywood movies anymore. I just watch the old movie. I'm not going to watch. Yeah, I'm not going to watch. So you don't elevate good stuff. And you're surprised that you're surrounded by slop, you know, or or Tom Hanks. Didn't he know Jeffrey Epstein? There was no evidence that Tom Hanks slept with young people or anything like that. You know, if you're always going to find reason not to support the people in the culture who do something beautiful, who do something that's good, you're going to get the culture you deserve. In this movie, all Tom Hanks does, it's a true story about a submarine captain, and all he does is read the Bible, pray to God, and kill Nazis. That's the whole movie, and it's an exciting movie. Not a, it's not the greatest movie, but it's a really good movie and very exciting. All he does, read the Bible, worship God, and kill Nazis. All right, here is a review of written by Elizabeth Lash Quinn, professor of a history department, and I'm not attacking her. She's a very bright woman, I know. Greyhound shows us what the principled application of stoicism to a person's life might look like. It's just not true. It's, it simply isn't true. It's about Jesus and the Bible and God and what that looks like in a person's life. This is in the movies, too. Okay, here's Johnny Cash talking about what saved his life when he was addicted to drugs and alcohol. And I find that every day that I make my daily commitment to him and don't break that commitment, then the day works beautifully if I put my will and make his will be my will. Now, go watch the movie, 2005 Johnny Cash biopic called Walk the Line. There is one maybe 20 seconds scene in it when he gets out of his car to go to church and he starts to kind of pull back and his wife, played by Reese Witherspoon, takes him into the church. That's the scene. There was a larger scene that they cut out where he's in the church, but even that scene doesn't have Jesus in it. Even that scene does not mention the faith that became a cent- the center of his life. Uh, Laura Hildenbrand, she wrote this wonderful book called Unbroken about Olympian uh, Louis Zamperini, Louis Zamperini, uh, who was tortured by the Japanese. A guard named Bird tortured him just horribly. The book is wonderful, but it's very hard to read because of the pain and suffering he went through. There is a scene. He gets out. He comes back from being a POW during World War II. He's been tortured unbelievably. He keeps having nightmares about the bird. He's drinking heavily. He's angry all the time. He wakes up one morning, one one night, and he's strangling his wife. And she's going to leave him. She can't stand the rage and the alcoholism anymore. He's just been destroyed by this experience. She goes and she hears Billy Graham, and Billy Graham renews her faith in Christianity. She decides she's not going to leave him, but he's got to go and see Billy Graham. And Zamperini goes, doesn't want to go. He hates the idea. He's furious. He doesn't want to hear about Jesus. I I was listening to this book on an elliptical machine. I was sobbing. I could barely run. I was so moved. Uh, Here's Zamperini himself talking about what happened when he gave himself over to Jesus Christ. I started having a flashback to the life raft and prison camp. All those thousands and thousands of prayers, God, spare my life through the war and I'll seek you and serve you. And I kept thinking, I came back from the war alive and I never even thought about those prayers. Never even tried to keep one prayer. I got off of my knees. Somehow I knew I was still getting drunk. I knew it. I also knew that I forgave all of my guards, including the bird. I knew it. And I think proof of that is I had nightmares every night about the birds since the war and after the war. And the night I made my decision for Christ, I haven't had a nightmare since. 1949 till now. And that is some kind of a miracle. <laughs> it just is so moving. The book, you got to read the book if you haven't read it. Just su- such a moving, moving story. Film version, Christ is edited out. He, he, they show him that he prays, and then there's an epilogue where it says, Zamperini made good to dedicate his life to God afterwards. Okay, so they just edited out that whole part of the story, which is the best part of the story. I think a Christian group actually went and made that movie, made the movie where they told the rest of the story, because if they were going to make a mainstream movie, who was it? Angelina Jolie directed that film. You got to edit out the Jesus. You got to delete Jesus. One of the most subtle versions of this is Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso, innocent as a dove, wise as a serpent, is a personality type who is an American evangelical. That is who he is. He is an American evangelical. He's just Ned Flanders. He's Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, right? It's the same person. But 
evangelicals have embraced Ted Lasso, but there's a Christian writer. I, I've said this myself, but I, I'll quote somebody else. Christian writer Mike Frost. He said, the show offers a Christless Christianity. God is never mentioned. Christmas is called Santa's birthday. And I noticed that instead of faith, they're always basically putting forward the one thing the left thinks causes salvation, which is anything goes sex. Anything goes sex is what Ted Lasso is all about. They deleted Christ. They want, you know, it's like they want salvation, but they don't want the savior. They want redemption, but they don't want the redeemer. They edit Christ out. And this creates a world in which you think, just like I thought when I was a young, sophisticated person, and now if you're a young person and you want to be sophisticated, you want to be part of the in crowd, you think that this is not what good people do. This is not what the right people do. They don't talk about Jesus. The word Jesus used to go down my spine like someone had dropped a centipede down my shirt. But that is a created thing. It is created by the culture by deleting Jesus, by editing him out. And it means that what is edited out is the entire philosophy of Christianity, which includes the fact that we are broken beings, that we are fallen beings, that not one of us is righteous. No, not one. Not one of us is born to have power over the other. And that's why we build systems like capitalism and democracy or Republican democracy that have inbuilt power struggles, that have struggles between one power and another, that have rules that are followed, even when that rule means that someone you don't like gets away. If you don't read the Miranda act to somebody, then that guy gets away, even though he's a criminal. You follow the rules because you are not to be trusted with power. When you lose your faith, you start to believe in human righteousness, and you start to believe that the righteous men like you, people like you, should wield power over others rather than adhering to a system that limits that power. But because there is no human righteousness, people who believe in this are deluded and they can no longer tell the difference between the delusions in their head and the reality outside them. That's the definition of madness. And as someone who has been both mad and sane, I can tell you that that is how America went mad. Grand Canyon University, it's an affordable private Christian university located in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona, praised for its culture of community, giving, and impact. Grand Canyon University integrates the free market system, welcoming Christian worldview perspectives into over 320 academic programs with more than 260 of these programs online. Grand Canyon University's online programs are designed to make earning your degree easy and accessible no matter your age or stage in life. Why wait? If you're ready to take your education to the next level, find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Visit gcu.edu. That's gcu.edu. You want to know what I do when I'm Shaven Clavin? Introducing the Precision 5 Razor. One handle, plus one blade cartridge kit for only $14.99. Jeremy's lowest cost for a razor and only for a limited time. It's crafted with a luxurious tungsten handle, five welded steel blades, and a flip-back trimmer for a close, smooth shave around hairlines and hard-to-reach places. Remember, the Precision 5 is no ordinary razor. It's a sword in the battle for beliefs a banner to wave into a new economy, a precision instrument to force woke companies to earn back your dollar and stop denigrating your values, but it's also still a razor and will give you a great shave. Stop giving your money to woke corporations that hate you. Join over 125,000 men who have ditched their woke razors and switched to Jeremy's. There's never been a better time or price. Go to jeremysrazors.com today. All right, we've changed a lot about the show. We like change. We like new things. And the, I think the, I have to say, the team did a great job with those graphics. If you're not watching, they're terrific. I think the music is terrific. Really good job in redoing it. But certain things remain the same. One of them is that you will now, uh, in a few moments, be plunged into the Clavenless Week. Now, the Clavenless Week will only be half a week because on Wednesday we will release an interview. So we will kind of, you know, we'll mitigate. Mitigate's a good uh, word. We'll mitigate the hellish destruction and darkness of the Clavenless Week. And we want to remind you to please send in your comments on the show or questions to clavenclapbacks at dailywire.com. That's K-L-A-V-A-N. As some of you may know, it's K-L-A-P-B-A-C-K-S at dailywire.com. That's an email address. So please send in your comments on the show there. But the one other thing that hasn't changed 
is what is going to happen when I say, now, Clavin clapbacks. I feel hunky-dunky. Life is tickety-boo. There it is. I missed it. Oh, I'm so happy. All right, from Mark. Love your show. I love how you point out the foibles and screw-ups in society. However, I don't understand why you focus primarily on girls and women's issues. It's usually presented in a positive and encouraging manner. When you mention boys and men, it's an afterthought or in a negative light. I can promise you that there are a lot of issues boys and men face that are in plain sight. No one wants to talk about it. Even if you had no empathy for men, when they do well, women benefit also. Let me uh, say that there is a reason that I do this. It's because I feel that women are the prime target of the left. Destroying the home and the family and tradition means destroying women. And I really feel that men are collateral damage. What I mean by that is to make women take the roles of men, men have to do less. They have to be less because men are better men than women are. And women are better women than men are. So in order to make women equal to men, as men, men have to do less, and that's why they've been attacked. But I also agree with you. I also think it's true that men are suffering, boys are suffering, and I'm going to talk about that next week. And yet, obviously, the news will dominate what I talk about, will control what I talk about, but it's Father's Day coming up, so I was planning to do an entire show talking about men. We'll see how much of that I get to. Uh, from Lindley, the Narnia books. I said that I didn't like the Narnia books. Now, remember, I say this loving C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is possibly, I won't say he's my favorite writer, but he is the man I admire most from the 20th century writers. Just a brilliant, brilliant man. I didn't like the Narnia books. I don't tend to like children's books anyway. So Lindley says, it occurs to me that you didn't read the whole series. That's true. I stopped. after I tried. I read three. I may have read four of the books, but I did finally give up after a while. And I didn't. There's one book, I think, maybe two that I haven't read. Your complaint is that Aslan, in your thoughts, Jesus, shows up to save the day when there are troubles, and that doesn't happen in real life. Are you really saying that God doesn't show up to save the day in real life? This is a fairy tale. In other words, not real life. So we're only, are we only supposed to write fairy tales where God doesn't show up to save the day? First of all, it's not, Aslan is not Jesus in my mind. They actually sacrifice him and he comes back to life. So I think it's, he's pretty well Jesus. Uh, she goes on to say, this is disturbing coming from a person who has a similar sense of humor to Lewis. Lewis's humor is more understated than yours. It is similarly dry. It really bothers me because I never understood why my brilliant mother never read the series. Perhaps it's a series that must be enjoyed when you're seven years old, though I once saw a fully grown man lock himself in his room for a week and finish the series in wonderment. Because there are those types of people, the ones who will lock themselves in a room for a week to immerse themselves in children's literature, I would only ask that you shut the hell up about not liking it because you might dissuade someone with a real imagination from reading the series. I get, you got heated as you were writing that. I can feel you getting angrier and angrier. Well, listen, I, I can't shut the hell up or I'll be out of a job. I understand that people love these things. Believe me, every time I talk about it, I know people love them. I just don't get it. To me, that's not the way Jesus works, and it's not a, in a fairy tale. I want to see the prince win the princess through fighting and the princess be beautiful enough to win the prince's heart. So no accounting for people's taste. Uh, from, who is this from? Oh, this is from a, a preacher who asked a really important question. Do you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God? From listening to your show, it seems that you don't believe this about the Bible. Um, as a minister of the gospel myself, I believe that this is foundational to all Christian faith. Uh, I believe that the Bible was inspired by God, but I believe it was written by men. And, you know, I know people have different beliefs about this, but people do have different beliefs about this. I believe it's the book God wants us to have about him and about his relationship with us. And I believe that it's composed of different genres, so not everything is literally true. I don't think you can tell the literal truth. I don't think you can tell the whole truth about God speaking literally. Jesus says, feed my sheep. He doesn't go out and mean feed he doesn't mean go out and feed a bunch of sheep. And I don't believe that every word spoken by every person carries the same weight. I mean, the devil quotes scripture in the Bible, so it shows that you can quote scripture and be telling a lie because the devil is lying. I saw a cartoon this week that said the first step to apostasy was saying, Paul is not Jesus. And I thought, yeah, but Paul is not Jesus. So if the first step to apostasy is telling the truth, there's something actually wrong with your religion. I don't believe that certainty 
I know we all want certainty, but I don't actually believe this certainty is a positive value. I believe that we're supposed to be uncertain and feel our way with God's help to God. And I believe the Bible, you can't do it with the Bible. It is a unique book about the relationship of God to people and how he formed people and what he formed them for and what Jesus came to do. And my faith in God and scripture is absolute. My faith in myself is And in my own certainties and in yourself and your certainties is not absolute because we are people and we are not righteous. And that is the difference about the way I read the Bible. And sometimes it causes people to get angry at me because of the things I say. I'm not telling you, I've always said I'm not a theologian. I am reading theologians all the time. I'm reading the Bible all the time. I'm praying all the time. And this is how I understand a book written by men and inspired by God. All right. If you want to be a member and avoid these clavenless weeks coming so quickly at you, you could have a member block. It's coming up. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code Claven at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. And then you can come over with the rest of us to the member block.